few modern people fear the power of ancient curses and hexes. But there are others who believe a deadly curse has been released on the world as recently as the 1920s. A curse that could make even skeptics think twice. An ancient tomb holds a huge treasure. An unbelievable wealth allegedly protected by an unknown evil. One by one, many of those who have disturbed the crypt have died mysteriously. Could it be a deadly hex? This is the story of the curse of Tutankhamun. On the banks of the Nile, the body of a boy king lies dead, wrapped in cloth and mysteriously sealed underground. Boy? An Egyptian pharaoh entombed with a priceless fortune some 3,000 years ago. 1,500 years before the birth of Christ, kings of Egypt known as pharaohs were buried in the Valley of the Kings, a land riddled with age-old mysteries that continue to fascinate us to this day. This is the Valley of Death. Chiseled out of the rock is the world's greatest mausoleum. The old saying goes, you can't take it with you. But the kings of ancient Egypt certainly tried to find a way. Each king was buried with priceless treasures of ivory, ebony, and gold. But each tomb was hidden under thousands of years of sandstorms and erosion. For archaeologists, the Valley of the Kings is still the richest place on Earth. But before the 1920s, they believed that it had already been picked clean by centuries of thieves and collectors. But they were wrong. At nine years old, he took the throne and a wife. By the age of 18, he was dead. 3,000 years later, only a handful of people knew the name. Tutankhamun. One was an unknown archaeologist named Howard Carter. Another, his financial backer, the fifth Earl of Carnarvon, George Edward Stanhope Herbert. A little-known digger and wealthy English lord were an odd couple to pursue ancient riches. But unlike those who had tried and failed before him, Carter carefully and methodically plotted out the Valley of the Kings, inch by inch, and set out to excavate. But he found only disappointment. So, in December of 1921, Carnarvon summoned Carter to Highclere Castle. He told Mr. Carter that he could no longer afford to pay for this useless digging in the far-off deserts of Egypt. But Carter begged Carnarvon to pay for just a few more months of excavating. He agreed, but made it clear this would be the last trip. On the third day of the final dig, workers uncovered stone steps leading to a hidden doorway stamped with an ancient seal. It was the mark of royalty. Carter sent for Lord Carnarvon right away. On the evening of November 26, 1922, they opened the tomb of King Tut and, according to legend, released the mummy's curse. An English lord and his daughter, along with an archaeologist and his assistant, stood on the threshold of the richest find in history. Carter peered into the gloom on the other side of the wall for what seemed like an eternity. At last, Carnarvon whispered, Can you see anything? 
Yes, Carter replied. Wonderful things. There's never been a pharaoh found in any way almost intact. We're talking about things that you look at now. You cannot believe that these are the thousands of years old that they are. It's awesome. The smallest explorer, Lady Evelyn Herbert, daughter of Lord Carnarvon, led the way inside. Three men, one woman, and somewhere, a dead king. It's dark. You're in there, the first person in a thousand years to be inside the tomb of a person who had died. There must have been a little of the old haunting, the hauntedness that comes with that. The tomb of the boy king was the richest ever found. Overnight, Carnarvon, Carter, and Tutankhamun became celebrities. They felt, I mean, just total triumph, victory. And they'd been laughed at, they'd been mocked. They'd been kind of a whispering campaign, they'd lost their marbles, you know. And here they have it. But Lord Carnarvon would have precious little time to enjoy his newfound fame and fortune. One morning in the spring of 1923, Lord Carnarvon cut himself, exactly where a mosquito bit him days before. The wound wouldn't heal. Carnarvon was racked with fever. As fever turned to chills, Carnarvon's wife summoned a specialist to Cairo. But Carnarvon was beyond help. And at the very moment that he died, all the lights suddenly went out in Cairo. Carnarvon's body was barely cold when the world's press named the culprit. Inscribed within the tomb, wrote one reporter, was a curse that warned, I will kill all those who cross this threshold. Another paper reported, they who enter this sacred tomb shall swift be visited by wings of death. For Carnarvon, death indeed came on wings, the wings of a mosquito. So began the legend of the mummy's curse. Some say that supposedly it continues even today, but scientists aren't so sure. Come along as we investigate the source of the mummy's curse. When Truth or Scare returns. Was there really a deadly spell cast thousands of years ago on the tomb of Tutankhamun? The tomb of King Tut has reportedly claimed lives of many victims. To this day, skeptics wonder if there is some truth to the lethal hex. But in 1922, Howard Carter shrugged off the curse and went back to work. Perhaps easier said than done. Almost immediately, wealthy travelers, fascinated by Tut's treasures and unafraid of his curse, descended on his tomb. One of the few allowed inside was the railroad tycoon, George J. Gould, guided by Carter himself. For his private tour, Gould paid a heavy price. That night, he came down with a fever. The next day, he died. Around the same time, a British industrialist suffered the same fate. But were they really victims of a curse? Or was there a more logical reason behind their deaths? I received a call from a physician, and he told me this very interesting and very unfortunate story about a woman um, who had gone with her husband uh, to Egypt and had gone into the tomb of King Tut, and it turned out that she had picked up a fungus. That woman was Cheryl Munson, a part-time art student and housewife. Cheryl died shortly after visiting the tomb in 1995. 
The cause, apparently, was exposure to a fungus called Aspergillus niger. So what we had to find out was whether these molds were also present in the tombs that she visited. And so we called the Egyptology department at the University of Pennsylvania. So they were wondering if this had anything to do with the curse. It had. In 1923, two men died suddenly after visiting Tut's tomb. What doctors chalked up to a fever was reported as Tut's curse. Two more sudden deaths followed. Pecky Callender, who helped Carter break into the tomb, and Arthur Mace, who helped to remove its contents. Possibly, the true killer lurked on the very walls of the tomb. To Howard Carter, it looked like chipped paint until he looked closer. Then he realized it was some sort of fungus. I think by connecting our case, which is a modern day case, to the visit and the tombs itself, we were able to have a direct link to what might have happened to the archeologist who had visited some time ago. And I am rather confident that in at least some of these cases, that Aspergillus could have easily played a role. This is really such a well-preserved mask. You can see these copper eyelashes around the stone eyes here. Dr. Rosalie David is the queen of mummies, a curator for Egyptology for England's Manchester University Museum. She's examined 35 mummies more than anyone else. Working with a mummy can be hazardous, both for the operator and for the mummy, because the operator could breathe in spores from the mummy dust. And uh, in reverse, uh, the operator could deposit uh, bacteria or moisture onto the surface of the mummy, thus causing decomposition. Though dead for thousands of years, a mummy is alive with germs and bacteria, some harmless, some deadly. We wear protective clothing when we work with the mummies, and this protects us against the fungal spores. Rosalie David believes she knows the true fate of those who disturb the bones of Tutankhamun. Their crude autopsy freed an invisible killer. In the old days, the operators didn't wear protective clothing. They could have unknowingly unleashed airborne toxins when the tomb was opened. If a little fungus caused all this destruction, why are the ancestors of Lord Carnarvon still filled with a case of the jitters? Find out when we return to Truth or Scare. Since the burial of King Tut, the so-called curse of the mummy has traveled across the centuries. By 1929, 13 people were dead. Anything remotely connected with the tomb of Tutankhamun seems to have left death and destruction in its path. The man who found Tut's tomb, Howard Carter, was among the few to escape its curse. Almost. His good friend Carnarvon is dead. He is under huge pressure from the Egyptians. He's under enormous pressure from the press that didn't get the story. He has a tiny little space to work in. He's going crazy. Howard Carter just gets to the point where he can't take it any longer. And he cracked. He did this rash act of putting this enormous iron gate and locking it. It was the English takeover of something that the people of Egypt owned, which was true. And they went crazy and they threw him out. After a year's suspension, Howard Carter was allowed back to the tomb. But he was forced to forever surrender his claim to Tut's treasure. So he spent the rest of his life cataloging Tut's priceless treasures. The treasures that he found, but could never own. Perhaps his was the worst curse of all. Howard Carter hoped to put an end to the so-called mummy's curse. Before his death in 1939, he arranged for the young king's remains to be returned to his tomb, but Tut wouldn't rest in peace. 
In a chain reaction of tragedy, his curse claimed five more victims in quick succession. First, Lady Carnarvon died suddenly and strangely of an insect bite, just like her husband. Then, Richard Beetel, Lord Carnarvon's secretary, died mysteriously in his sleep, with no explanation. Three months later, Beetel's father, Lord Westbury, leapt from a seventh floor window to his death. He left a note blaming his son's death on the curse of King Tut. On the way to the cemetery, Lord Westbury's hearse struck an eight-year-old boy. At the exact moment the boy died, so did an Egyptologist at the British Museum. Next, the treasures of Tutankhamun go on tour and the so-called curse invades the modern world. When Truth or Scare returns. Tutankhamun was buried with 5,000 priceless belongings. His royal treasures were meant to join him on his journey to the afterlife. Instead, they took a detour. A deadly detour. In the 1970s, Egypt bowed to popular demand and sent scores of Tut's relics on a world tour. Among the sightseers, when the treasure reached London, was the first person to enter Tut's tomb, Lady Evelyn Herbert. My mother had never seen the final sarcophagus because they hadn't reached that particular chamber before her father died. At the time of the exhibition in London, the television and radio used to ring up my mother and say, uh, tell us about the curse, and she'd laugh and say, well, I'm alive and kicking at 70, and uh, I don't believe in it. And coming out of the museum, probably on her fifth visit, she had a major stroke and was paralyzed from then on. But of course, it could easily have been a coincidence. <laughs> Some say these incidents were not caused by an evil hex at all. Dr. David Silverman, a renowned Egyptologist, sought out another logical origin of Tut's curse. In any of the inscriptions that occur in the tomb, there are none that can be considered a curse. So what we would consider, or as an Egyptologist, I would consider an ancient Egyptian curse does not occur in the tomb of King Tut. It appears that the mummy's curse was accidentally created by its first victim. When Lord Carnarvon gave exclusive coverage of Tut's tomb to the London Times, rival papers were furious. At Carnarvon's death, they got even by printing rumors of a curse. Even the weird events when Carnarvon died can be explained. All the lights went out in Cairo when Carnarvon died. The lights always go out in Cairo at all times. All of this stuff took off. It was just like anything today. An outrageous series of half-truths and some truths and some lies, some made up. The son of Lord Carnarvon talked about how he doesn't really believe in the curse, but he said there really isn't any way to explain a lot of what went on. And that has kept the curse alive. No matter how you try to kill it, it's like a phoenix. It resurfaces over and over again. But then again, no matter how much we hear that there isn't a Loch Ness monster or that there aren't any UFOs through logical means, we still believe in them, don't we? It's marvelous human nature. We need this sort of stuff. We love it. Even if I know it's all made up, I love it. I love the Tut curse. The treasure of Tutankhamun now makes its home in the Cairo Museum, where untold numbers have gazed upon it in wonder. 
but the mummy itself once again rests in its ancient home in the Valley of the Kings. Once the least known pharaoh, he is now the most famous. Tutankhamun, now a household name, has what all pharaohs wanted most. He has gained immortality, if only a name. Ironically, this young Egyptian pharaoh owes his fame to the English nobleman, who some 3,000 years later disturbed his tomb. This is the same man who is believed to have unleashed a chain reaction of death. But whether it was by exposing the world to a lethal mold or by unlocking an ancient curse, we will always be fascinated with the life and death of the boy king known as Tutankhamun.